Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on ultrasonic power measurement. We'll begin by reminding ourselves of the definition of power. Power is simply the energy delivered a unit time. When that power is delivered by an ultrasonic wave, a common starting point is ultrasonic intensity. But this is an instantaneous quantity that's time varying. And therefore, the first step we need to do as we move towards power is to integrate that instantaneous intensity to yield a time averaged intensity. We also see that power has no dependence on spatial coordinates. We therefore need to integrate our time averaged intensity over surface S as spatial averaging to achieve our power. Power is therefore a spatially and temporally averaged quantity. A common way of determining ultrasonic power is with a radiation force balance. Let's introduce that for you. We start off with an accurate microbalance, which will have a water vessel and some kind of target shown. Here we have an absorbing target, but other target types are available. We arrange for an ultrasonic transducer to be configured so that its field radiates onto the target. When the ultrasonic transducer is switched on, there is a momentum exchange that occurs when the ultrasonic wave encounters the target. This is translated as a downward motion and therefore perceived by the balance as an effective mass. Please note that this is a direct measurement. There's a direct relationship between the ultrasonic power and the effective mass perceived on the balance. This allows us to achieve measurement uncertainties, typically less than 7%. And radiation force balances are sufficiently important in the measurement of ultrasonic power that there is an IEC standard dedicated to their implementation. This is IEC 611. Six one. Let's look at the relationship between power and radiation force. We know that power can be expressed as force times the speed. And when the power is being delivered by an ultrasonic wave propagating in water, the speed of interest is the speed of sound in water. We've also seen that our radiation force balance is measuring force by considering an effective mass. And therefore, from Newton's second law, we know that the acceleration of interest is the acceleration due to gravity. We can combine these two equations to give us a single expression that power is speed of sounding water times effective mass times acceleration due to gravity. This is at least true for absorbing targets. The equation is slightly different for other target types. For typical values of speed of sound in water of 1480 meters per second and acceleration due to gravity of 9.81 meters per second squared. We find that the conversion factor between effective mass and power is only 68.9 milligrams per watt. Therefore, if we're to measure powers below 10 milliwatts, we need to be able to effectively measure masses below one microgram. This requires highly accurate microbalances. Let's consider now choice of target. An absorbing target is typically arranged in the bottom of a water vessel so that we have incident ultrasound upon it and none of that signal reflects back towards the transducer. It is all absorbed within the target and all of the radiation force results in an effective downwards motion of the target structure. In a reflecting target, we typically have a conical reflector arranged with absorbers to the side of the measurement vessel. Here, when the incident ultrasound comes from above, they're reflected through 90 degrees and the incident wave then propagates to the absorbers. But again, there is a momentum exchange at the surface of the reflecting target. And again, we have the intention of trying to ensure that the target propagates downwards and all of the radiation force is perceived as effective mass. However, for reflecting targets, 
alignment is much more critical and there are other limitations that are imposed. These can all be found within IEC 61161 in clause 5.2.3. Care should therefore be used when selecting reflecting targets for use with certain transducer configurations. Let's look at some of the limitations of an RFB measurement. As we've said, we're trying to ensure that all of the radiation force is converted into an effective mass. If, however, there is vibration of the transducer relative to the target, only a vector component of the radiation force will be translated into mass on the balance. If the target is too small, then it may not encompass all of the ultrasonic beam. So again, not all of the effective radiation force is translated into a mass measurement. And similarly, if we have an imperfect absorber, some of the signal will be reflected back towards the transducer and will impact its radiation efficiency. Let's look at an RFB in detail. Here we can see a draft shield has been placed around the entire structure. This is to try and minimize the effect of airborne vibration and drafts affecting the measurement components. We also have a rigid transducer mounting to ensure that we've got repeatability and rigidity in the way that the transducer is held over the target. And a large absorbing target is shown here to make sure that we encompass all of the beam radiated from the transducer. Let's look at the typical trace that we may see from a radiation force balance. Here, we'll be looking at the effective mass reported by the balance as a function of time. In fact, what we will do is switch the transducer on and off for four separate cycles. We note that if we look at each of the on cycles, immediately following the ongoing transition, there is a drift upwards of the trace. What is happening here is because the absorber is very efficient, all of the ultrasonic energy incident upon it is being converted into thermal energy. This is causing a change in the properties of the absorber through expansion, and we therefore see a drift in the signal. If we were only to consider the power as a direct proportion of effective mass, we would see there's quite a range of values from this trace. In fact, there's nearly 25% variation between smallest and largest mass, and therefore between smallest and largest power. This is quite a range, and it would be better to improve upon this. So let's consider one of those traces in detail. The first thing to note is the change in baseline on either side of the peak. Here, a dotted line has been introduced to show this variation. We can also say, as shown by the oval, a little oscillation immediately following the ongoing transition. This is common with transducers that take a while to achieve a steady state. A straight line has now been introduced to indicate the direction of drift of the peak. If we look at the change in effective mass from the baseline to the superimposed straight line, we can see there's very little variation between the ongoing and offgoing transitions. In this case, less than 1% difference. This yields considerable measurement advantage. By looking at four cycles, we have four independent measurements at ongoing transitions and four independent measurements at offgoing transitions, giving us eight measurements in total and giving us a good ability for statistical analysis and formation of mean and standard deviation. This all contributes to a very low level of measurement uncertainty. We will now consider an alternative method of determining ultrasonic power by means of scanned hydrophone measurement. Our starting point is an ultrasonic transducer immersed in water and radiating ultrasound. We can define a selection of measurement coordinates, in this case a grid, in front of the field of the transducer. We introduce a hydrophone and we scan the tip of this hydrophone to each of the locations in the measurement grid. This allows us to melt the pressure field produced by the transducer. 
We've already seen that the radiation force balance enables us to make a measurement of ultrasonic power in a few tens of seconds. Scanned hydrophone measurements are much slower. Typically, a 100 by 100 point scan can take three hours worth of measurement. So why would we incur this measurement overhead? Hydrophone sensitivity is such that we're able to record pressure signals as low as a few kilopascals. And even if these are temporarily short, with low amplitude, we can still get a measurable value for ultrasonic intensity. However, this time average intensity is likely to be so low that it would not be measurable with a radiation force balance. So what we've achieved with the scanned hydrophone measurement is the ability to measure much lower ultrasonic powers, although at the expense of a much longer measurement. There are some other factors that we need to consider with scanned hydrophone measurements as well. We'll begin by considering the double integral equation we saw earlier. In order to get from the voltage signal produced at the output of the hydrophone to a pressure signal, we have to include the pressure response and the directivity function. We've also had to convert that voltage into a pressure signal, probably by some deconvolution means. If you're less familiar with these topics, there are additional PA tutorial videos on frequency response, directivity, and the conversion of voltage to pressure signals. That hydrophone will have a calibration uncertainty. This is typically at least 10% and often higher. And in order to convert from a pressure to a time average intensity signal, we've had to make use of the plane wave assumption, which may or may not be appropriate for the field we're considering. Finally, there may be positional accuracies, or we may have insufficiently sampled the field when we defined our measurement locations. It's also important to note that in addition to a hydrophone, some kind of mechanical positioning system is almost essential for these operations. As we've seen, this is an indirect measurement, and as a result, measurement uncertainties can be much higher. It's typically at least 20% measurement uncertainty when making a determination of power by a scanned hydrophone measurement, although we can make measurements at much lower powers. For further details, one can consult IEC 62127 Part 1, specifically Clause 7.2.7, .7 for further information on power determination by scanned hydrophone measurement. In summary, we've seen that radiation force balances are a quick, simple method to evaluate ultrasonic power, but struggle when powers are below 5 milliwatts. Reflecting radiation force balance targets should be used with care, and there are a number of restrictions on their usage listed in IEC 61161. Hydrophone scanning can measure very much lower powers, but to much slower operation with much higher uncertainty. We hope you found this interesting. If you did, come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics tutorial videos.